Brianna, what's on your radar? Well, Ravi, it's been a big news week, so it's hard to even know where to start. Of course, you're all probably well aware by now that last week we saw the second largest bank failure in U.S. history when Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. Blame has been spread all around. One Wall Street Journal op-ed even pointed to the existence of a singular black person on the bank's board and opined as to whether wokeness was the cause of the bank run. Quote, then there's this in its proxy statement. SVB notes that besides 91% of their board being independent and 45% being women, they also have one black, one LGBTQ plus, and two veterans. I'm not saying 12 white men would have avoided this mess, but the company may have been distracted by diversity demands. <laughs> Yikes. Now, I, for one, think that veterans are perfectly capable of running a bank. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> but most people with any interest or understand, uh, in or understanding uh, uh, of this crisis and who want to prevent crises like these in the future point to bipartisan deregulation during the Trump administration as the real cause. The deregulation exempted banks like SVB from rules designed to prevent deposit-taking banks from engaging in risky investments and financial speculation. That's according to reporting by The Lever. You see, Prior to 2017, the Volcker Rule prevented federally insured banks from owning or investing in private equity or hedge funds because they're illiquid, difficult to turn into cash if depositors actually want to take their money out. But in 2017, it got a five-year exemption from the rule, and a few years, years later, the Trump administration granted that exemption to the entire banking in industry. Moreover, the Dodd-Frank rollback in 2018 made it so that banks like SVB were subject to less strict oversight and weaker liquidity rules. Here's Trump bragging about that exact deregulation. As a candidate, I pledged that we would rescue these community banks from Dodd-Frank, the disaster of Dodd-Frank. And now we are keeping that commitment, and all of the people with me are keeping that commitment. We passed and signed a record number of bills terminating job-killing regulations. In the history of our country, no president, whether it's four years, eight years, or 16 years in one case, has ever passed more regulation cuts. That's uh, an effort to protect small community banks like SVB, one of the 20 biggest commercial banks in the country. Now, additionally, SVB notably had no risk officer for most of last year, a factor which seems more likely to have had an effect on the bank's failure than, again, the presence of one black or gay person on the board. Now, it's not clear if the bank would have collapsed if the Volcker rule had been in place, but it certainly didn't help. Remember, things went south not merely because the bank lacked capital, but because it couldn't liquidate enough capital to cover withdrawals. They'd overinvested in long-term bonds, and the value of those bonds decreased significantly as a consequence of historically high interest rates. In short, they bet wrong. And because the bank had overinvested in tech startups, which couldn't be as easily liquidated as stock in publicly traded companies, when the proverbial mess hit the fan, it hit hard. Moreover, the Trump regulatory rollbacks exempted banks of SVB size from regulations like stress tests that would have assessed whether the bank's investment strategies could stand up to market changes like high interest rates. But without those guardrails, we know what happened. Interest rate hikes combined with diminished venture capital activity hurt the bank's cash resources, and depositors started to flee. When the bank sold off $21 billion in bonds at a loss, a run of the bank ensued. So, but here's where things go from worrying to infuriating. After lobbying the government to exempt them from the rules that were supposed to protect depositors from risky behavior and profiting mightily from it, I might add, the government stepped in to the rescue. Whereas small business owners, families that struggle to pay for their health care costs and student debtors are on our own, apparently, the government response to crying tech billionaires was as fast as anything we've seen the government ever do. After high-profile Silicon Valley depositors made a stink on social media, the Fed announced that it would guarantee uninsured deposits, well over the typical $250,000 insurance cap. More than 90% of SVB's deposits were over that cap, by the way. 
Whereas regular folks are told we have to accept the consequences of our actions, the same can't be said, apparently, of corporate elites. Now, keep in mind, this is a bipartisan deregulatory story I just told. Yes, the deregulation was passed under Trump and with a majority of Republicans, but 17 Democrats voted for it as well. And the bank lobbyists lobbied both Obama and Trump administrations to varying degrees of success. That's important to consider as we move on to the next big story of the week. It's important to see how all of these things are connected. Now, you see, Biden betrayed yet another campaign promise this week as he greenlit the Willow Oil Project, an $8 billion plan to extract 600 million barrels of oil from pristine Alaskan federal lands. Theodore Roosevelt's rolling in his grave. Just as the International Energy Agency is warning that governments must stop approving new dirty energy projects if we want any chance at avoiding the worst impacts of climate change, Biden approved this plan. Why? Well, by his own admission, because he doesn't want a legal fight with ConocoPhillips, the oil company that holds leases to the prospective drilling site. In order to avoid a lawsuit with ConocoPhillips, Biden has sacrificed the future of the planet and betrayed one of his most fundamental campaign promises. A quick reminder of what Biden sounded like on the campaign trail on this issue. There's no more drilling, including offshore. No ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period. Ends. Whoops. <laughs> As the largest single drilling project proposed on federal land, the Willow Project will dramatically undermine the much vaunted emission savings of the Inflation Reduction Act, doubling the amount Biden said he'd plan to reduce, according to climate activist Sameek Mopin. And importantly, the harms that will accrue are not in some far-off distant future. On Democracy Now!, Mopin explained that her tribe will be exposed to poor air quality, possible fuel leaks, and displacement. The oil company, ConocoPhillips, already owns the only air quality testing system in the area. Conflict of interest much? And residents are already experiencing effects of environmental pollution very similar to the stories we've heard out of East Palestine. Yet another small working class community stands to be devastated. Just like East Palestine, we see industry groups pressing the government to make decisions, not on the basis of the interests of the population, but based on the short-term profits of corporations. Lobbyists control our government. They're making our bank deposits vulnerable. They're turning our children's air into poison. And they're at the root of crises like the one we've been discussing in East Palestine for weeks now. So what does our political class have to say about all of this? Well, while Biden is avoiding East Palestine, drilling in the Arctic and sending unlimited lethal aid to Ukraine, his administration is criticizing a collision between a Russia fighter jet and a U.S. drone as being, quote, environmentally unsound of all things. Now, <laughs> me, I wouldn't use the word wokeness to describe this, but if this is the kind of thing people are criticizing when they talk about the shoehorning in of these kind of social justice issues as a cover for nonsense like this, I am 100% against it. Meanwhile, of course, there is no support for any investigation into accusations that the U.S. was behind the Nord Stream pipeline bombing. That was, in fact, the worst methane accident in human history. Biden even trotted out Native American Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, to run cover for the disastrous Willow Project. Third is the Willow Project, which is a difficult and complex issue that was inherited. These are existing leases issued by previous administrations as far back as the 90s. As a result, we had limited decision space, but we focused on how to reduce the project's footprint and minimize its impacts to people and to wildlife. What was approved reflects a substantially smaller project than ConocoPhillips originally proposed. Oof, what a cope. I mean, no disrespect to Deb Haaland, but this is exactly the kind of weaponized identity politics conservatives should be focused on, in my view. The use of historically marginalized groups to sanitize projects, which obviously run against the people's interests, it's similar to what banks like SVB do when they donate to Black Lives Matter. To be clear, these banks don't care about black people. They hope to buy goodwill and avoid blame for their bad actions. The company didn't fail because it's woke or because it had a black or gay person on the board. 
but it was hoping it could avoid scrutiny if it seemed like a good social justice actor. You see, these companies realize that actually doing the right thing in their own field costs money, but performing support for marginalized groups is free. And that's a real problem, but not because <laughs> the gays and blacks are taking over the banks or the veterans. Over and over again, we see this pattern. Corrupt politicians and the billionaires who pay them off write our laws and then want to escape the consequences of their own economic failures, sometimes by hiding behind a veneer of progressivism. Sometimes they hide behind more meritorious victims like mom and pop depositors or alleged small business owners. Now, of course, those people are vulnerable, but they shouldn't be props used to pass policies that ultimately serve to protect elites. Former Treasury Secretary and Harvard President Larry Summers says we shouldn't be concerned about the moral hazard arguments with respect to SVB, but he's super worried about the moral hazard of helping kids that were too poor to pay for college. Billionaire Mark Cuban invades against regulators until it's time to secure his deposits. The occasional ethical politician who takes no corporate money, like Bernie Sanders, my former boss, he predicts it all, but is shut out of having any real power in politics by the corporate machine of the Democratic Party. In 2020, he warned you of Biden's bad environmental record. In 2015, he said, quote, this banking bill is a disaster. The Wall Street crash of 2008 showed the American people how fraudulent many of these large banks are. The last thing we should be doing is deregulating them. But despite his warning, we walked right into the lion's den. Men and women with insight as good as Bernie's never get especially close to levers of power. The establishment won't let them. And isn't it increasingly obvious why? The people we do elect, well, they ensure Silicon Valley elites are bailed out while food stamps are being cut. And they feel so untouchable while they do this that they give speeches like this one with impunity. Mr. President, I have yet to meet a person in Minnesota that is hungry. Yet today, I have yet to meet a person in Minnesota that says they don't have access to enough food to eat. Now, I should say that hunger is a relative term, Mr. President. You know, I had a cereal bar for breakfast. I guess I'm hungry now. 338,000 people in Minnesota are facing hunger. Over 120,000 of those people are children. It won't surprise you to learn that State Senator Steve Drakowski, who in that clip was advocating against free lunches, is also pro-deregulation. My point is this, what all these issues have in common is the negative influence of corporate money in the form of lobbying and campaign contributions. The outcomes in our country aren't determined by left or right or what's in the best interest of the general public. They're determined by a duopoly that supports corporate welfare while kids' stomachs literally growl. My fear is that ping-ponging blame between political parties gets us nowhere. Blame legitimately lies on all sides because there's corporate money on all sides. The only way out is through, but can Americans put aside the culture wars, anti-woke screeds, and fights over who is the biggest victim long enough to realize that we're all victims of an enemy much bigger than each other. Yeah, it's been uh, kind of disturbing to see the focus on wokeness specifically as the problem with the Silicon Valley Bank um, that I've seen from people on the right, because you can just be against um, bailing out the banks in the, the, the government shouldn't shouldn't bail people out. Like, that's already a conservative principle, but it's like they forgot that it was, so they had to, you know, reason their way to it via wokeness. I appreciated that we had Vivek Ramaswamy on, on yesterday who, uh, who said that he didn't think wokeness was, like, the major thing to concentrate on here and opposes the bailout. Um, yeah, look, to your point, I think we're in this bad middle ground where people will push for deregulation but then still want to be to have the government and then the taxpayers on the hook for helping the entity when things go wrong. And uh, again, as Vivek was saying on the show yesterday, that, yeah. that is just the worst of both worlds. They, they want to privatize profit and socialize, and socialize risk. Yeah. So, you know, look, I, it occurs to me that what some conservatives are doing with the wokeness and the banks thing right now is the flip side of what Hillary Clinton said back in 2016, which was, 
while breaking up the banks cure racism. So at the time, Bernie was making these arguments about how dangerous some of these deregulatory decisions were, how there wasn't enough accountability for Wall Street. We're still much closer to the financial crisis. Obviously, families still haven't recovered from those enormous losses where 30 or 40 percent of household wealth completely disappeared after 2008, 2009. Um, and while these corporations were bailed out, the banks were bailed out, and almost zero people went to jail, the American homeowner was left dangling, and even those TARP, for, TARP funds that were allotted were never distributed. So here comes Bernie Sanders pointing some of that out, and Hillary Clinton's rhetorical magic was to say, hey, Bernie, but will doing the thing that saved, that would save the economic interests of millions of American families, disproportionately black families, by the way, which lost 40% of their, their net wealth in the housing crisis, would that end racism? So you see, as a leftist, yeah. I'm very familiar with the idea of trying to use um, kind of social justice as a way to obscure economic policies that actually inure to the benefit of, of historically marginalized group and working class people disproportionately. And to see it happening on the right when really there should be a, a robust, genuinely populist movement of people across the political spectrum coming together to agree on issues like, obviously, you should you should regulate banks. Obviously, you should have rules in place that pr protect depositors. Obviously, we shouldn't be bailing out the rich, but ignoring the fact that we are one of the only countries in the world where we have this thing called medical debt, because people who get cancer are overwhelmingly likely to have their family go into bankruptcy. I mean, these are questions that should have a, uh, th these are issues rather that should have a significant political consensus behind them. And part of the reason that we don't is because on one side you have liberals saying things like, well, this economic policy isn't frankly woke enough. It's not uh, targeting um, specifically black or brown people enough. So it doesn't, must not matter. And on the other side, you have people say, well, this company, this corporation that is literally exploiting everybody in the country is too woke. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, want to do anything about it. Indeed. All right. We'll have more rising right after this. Please stay with us.